In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Lord, Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving us another day of life. Thank you for calling us to yourself in Jesus. And Lord, thank you for the different gifts and vocation that you've given to each one of us that we continue to discover in you throughout our high school career. We ask you to be with us today, open our hearts to the wisdom of your Holy Spirit so that we can, through our speaker and through your gifts, continue to grow closer to you. We ask all this through Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, well, hey, it's really, really great to be here this morning for our guest speaker, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. Um, you know that we talk a lot of, at J. Sarah about the idea of human dignity. It is at the heart of our identity formation program. It's really what undergirds the virtue program. It's the idea of human dignity. Why is that so important for J. Sarah and for Catholics? Well, almost all the challenges we face in life come down to one of two things. They come down to either us not really understanding and embracing our own dignity or us not being able to recognize and honor the dignity of our neighbor. That's really at the bottom of almost every challenge that we face. And Christ has come to restore our understanding of our own dignity as sons and daughters of God so that we can know the greatness that he's made us for and so that we can love every person we meet the way he loves them. And that's what Deacon is going to try to walk us through a little bit today. Um, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers is a television host, a radio host, an author, an incredibly dynamic speaker, as you're about to experience. And he spends 42 out of 52 weeks of the school year, of the, of the calendar year, excuse me, traveling and giving talks on just about every topic you can imagine. And this topic is one of his sweet spots. So I'm really grateful for him being here today. Deacon um, is a father of five. He and his wife live in Portland, Oregon. And we are really blessed to have him here today. He's also a Notre Dame grad for all of you who are Irish fans out there. Thank you, thank you. All right, without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. So Monday, we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his legacy. And when I was researching my latest book called Building a Civilization of Love, A Catholic Response to Racism, I started exploring the writings of Dr. King. Because everybody's heard of him, but how many people have actually read what the man actually wrote? Because it impressed me, how could this Southern Baptist preacher in the midst of Jim Crow segregation, rally people together. I mean, he transcended political ideology and race and political parties, and he brought people together, not with polemics, not with triumphalism, but with the gospel. That's how he was able to bring people together. He preached a message of love. Now, when he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize, he said this, Sooner or later, all the people of the world will have to discover a way to live together in peace. And he went on to say that we have to evolve for all humanity a conflict method which rejects, rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method, he said, is love now. What kind of love is he talking about here? He's not talking about groovy kind of love or Van Halen ain't talking about love. He's talking about the love that St. John talks about in his letter, 1 John 4, 16. He says, God is love. And he who lives in love lives in God. And God lives in him. I told some of your parents that came to the talk last night that we live in a culture today that says that Love is about contractual relationships. It's just a contract, a negotiation between two people. What does contractual language sound like? Friends with benefits, hit it and quit it. And that garbage language that so many of you use to describe relationships, 
where we treat each other as objects for pleasure and gratification. That is not God's plan. When God wants to establish a relationship with us, he don't establish a contract. He establishes a covenant. A contract is merely an exchange of goods. This is yours and this is mine. A covenant is an exchange of persons. I am yours and you are mine. It's making a complete and total gift of yourself to someone. And that someone makes a complete and total gift of themselves back to you in love that is free and faithful and total and fruitful. It's a love that gives everything. It's a love that holds nothing back because Jesus held nothing back of his love for us on the cross. He gave everything. And that's exactly what he expects from us. And that was the key to Dr. King's success. Racial injustice and prejudice are antithetical to authentic truth, freedom, and peace. So now, we have to define our terms here. There's a difference between prejudice and racism. The problem is they've become conflated in our culture. If you say something, that's racist, that's racist. Uh, no. There's a distinction. So prejudice, prejudice is making a preconceived notion about someone not based on any factual knowledge or objective experience. And that kind of thinking leads to stereotyping. Racism is prejudice, as I just defined it, with the added piece, the reason why I believe this is that my race is superior to your race. That's racism. So let me give you a clear example. A few years back, I was preaching a parish mission. And someone came up to me and said, oh, you went to Notre Dame. What position did you play? Now, you hear something like that, and your first thought, that's racist. It's not racist. Was it prejudice? Yes. Was it stupid? Yes. Was it racist? No. Why? Because in order for that statement to be racist, he would have to admit when he said it, the reason why I just asked you that was because I believe that people that look like you are not intelligent enough to get into an academic institution of that caliber. And the only way a person of color can get into a school like that is with athletics. That would have been racist. But that's not what he meant, because when he found out that I actually never played football, my high school is a poor inner city high school in Newark, New Jersey, the, mon the monks couldn't afford football, I wrestled for four years. When he found out that I had an academic scholarship to Notre Dame, then he went, oh, Deacon, oh, oh sorry, you know, and he kind of backpedaled, right? See, what should have happened? He should have said, oh, you went to Notre Dame, what did you study? Because that's what he would have asked anybody else. So we have, to, if we're going to bring human dignity, especially with the issue of race, we have to make sure that we're making distinctions because that's important. Same thing with institutions. Everybody says, institutional racist. Like, for example, the church is institutionally racist. That's impossible. The church was founded by Jesus Christ. It's impossible for the church to be racist. Impossible. But there's people in the church who are racist and prejudiced. For example, my little parish, Immaculate Heart of Mary in Portland, Oregon, we're in the hood. Like we literally have drug dealing and prostitution along the, set up right along the side of the church. That's a normal occurrence for us. But, in the, and the parish is half Vietnamese, and the other half are Africans from about nine different countries, Filipinos, and a bunch of other folks. We're a very racially diverse parish. But it hadn't always been like that. Back in the 40s and early 50s, it was a German and Irish parish. In fact, we still, on our high altar, we have, of course, our church is Immaculate Heart of Mary. She's got a beautiful statue of the Blessed Mother. And then we have St. Bonaventure on one side and St. Patrick on the other side. Great. So back during World War II, we have a huge shipyard in Portland. 
So we had a lot of people of color come up from Mississippi, from Alabama, from Louisiana to work in the shipyards. Well, Immaculate Heart is the closest parish to the shipyards. So they used to come up for Mass at Immaculate Heart. And when they came to Immaculate Heart, they had to sit in the back of the church or in the choir loft, not with everybody else. Now, wait a minute. This is the Catholic Church. The church does not is not supposed to follow Jim Crow. The church is not supposed to follow segregation. The church is supposed to follow Jesus Christ. Now, all the teachers of the church say you're not supposed to do that, but there were people in the church. You have to ask yourself, wait a minute. The church is not teaching this. It's these pastors and some of these other leaders in the church that are not following the gospel that they're supposed to be preaching about. That's the issue. So you have to make a distinction between institutional racism and people in institutions who are racist. Again, we have to make these very clear distinctions if we're going to bring any level of healing. Now, where do these attitudes come from? Because you're not born racist. You're not born prejudiced. I mean, think about it. You see little kids on the playground, four, five, six years old. They're just playing. They're just having fun. They're just kids playing. They're not, you don't see a five-year-old, I'm not going to play with you because you're Asian. They don't do that. But what happens over time? Movies. They look at television. They hear jokes from their friends. They see things on the internet. They hear conversations maybe with their parents or something like that. And they begin to evolve and learn about these ideas about this particular group is this and this particular group is that. And they de develop these caricatures of races that are sometimes belittling and derisive, and even subliminally plant these seeds of half-truths in their mind about, oh, this is what this person is like. So how do we defeat that? Very simple. Page one of the Bible, Genesis 1, 27, says we are made in the image and likeness of God. We've all heard that, right? But what does that actually mean? to be made in God's image and likeness. The word image is a masculine noun in Hebrew, salem. It means a shadow that's the outline or representation of the original. So if you're standing in the light, you're casting a shadow, right? Is the shadow me? No, it's the image. It's the outline. It's the representation of me. But yet if I move, the shadow moves with me. What does that mean spiritually? Are we God? Yeah, that better, that, yes, that better be a very emphatic no, or else we got to have another talk first, all right? Of course we're not God. But 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says we are partakers in the divine nature. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Paul says our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit that we have within us from God. Genesis 2, 9 says that God breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. Nishmak ruach ka'im in Hebrew. Gorgeous phrasing for God taking the very breath of his divine life and pouring that life into us. We're not God, but we have God's image, God's outline, God's shadow, if you will, imprinted onto our souls. So what does that mean? Like when you move and the shadow moves, we're supposed to mirror God. So when we speak, we're reflecting the speech of God. When we think, we're reflecting the mind of God. And when we love, we're reflecting the heart of God, the love of God. That's the way God set it up in the beginning. What about likeness, demus in Hebrew, which means similar. So let's just say um, someone wanted to create a pat. Wanted to create a Deacon Harold statue. Don't do that, by the way. But you put the statue of me on one side and my son Benjamin, you put Ben on the other side of me. Now, you would look and say, they are both in my likeness because they both look like me. In fact, the statue looks more like me than my son. But what does my son have that the statue doesn't have? An essence, a nature, a being. My stuff and God's stuff is in my son. So even though the statue looks more like me, my son is much more in my 
likeness. That is how we begin to really lay a foundation for human dignity. That is how, how we overcome racial injustice. That's how Martin Luther King saw the world. That's how St. Teresa of Calcutta saw the world. And that's how we need to see the world. Because when you look at someone standing in front of you, in the image and likeness of God, what are you looking at? You're looking at their heart. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, we get introduced to King David for the first time. Now, God is displeased with the first king of Israel who's Saul. Saul's not doing what God needs him to do. So he sends the prophet Samuel to the house of Jesse to anoint a new king of Israel. Now, Jesse has eight sons, but he only lines up seven of his sons, Eliab, Abinadab, Shema, and four other sons. What son does he leave out? What son doesn't he include in the lineup? David. Why? Because he's a teenager. He's just a kid. He's out there with the sheep, being the shepherd. You want, a new, you want to have a new king? This is man stuff. So he has all the men, and then David's out there with the sheep. See, Samuel failed to recognize that God uses young people all the time for his glory. We make the mistake of saying things like, oh, all of you teenagers, you're the future of the church. You're not the future of the church. You're the church now. And we need your energy. We need your, passion, your enthusiasm, your passion, your optimism. We need that in the life of the church now. Think about this. Samuel was a teenager when God called him. Solomon, the wisest king in the history of Israel, was a teenager when God called him. The Blessed Virgin Mary, the greatest human being ever created, was a teenager when she became the mother of God. God can do amazing things with you if you allow him. So Samuel goes up to the first son, Eliab. He's looking at him. Wow, this dude looks like a king. He goes to pour the oil of anointing. The Lord says, no, nope, not him. And Samuel's confused. Samuel's like, I'm at the right house. I got the oil. There's Jesse. What's the problem? And what does the Lord say to Samuel? He says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees, not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. Ah, that's the key. See, in Hebrew, the word for heart is leb. It just doesn't mean the organ that pumps blood through the body. The heart is the seat of the will. The heart is the place where your desire for God lives inside of you. That's where God can touch you. That's where God can change your life is in your heart. So when you look at the person standing in front of you, you want to see that person the way God sees them. You want to look at them through God's eyes. Because if you don't, it hurts. For example... How many of you know Paul J. Kim? You familiar with Paul Kim? Paul Kim and I are good friends. We spoke at a big conference, 5,000 middle schoolers in Chicago a few years ago. So I went first. I went out there. I spoke to the 5,000 kids. Then Paul was talking after me. So Paul, as, I'm, as Paul's about to go up to the stage, he goes, hey, Deacon, why don't you, after the talk, meet me in the hotel lobby. Let's grab some dinner. Okay, Paul, cool. So I'm dressed in a suit and a tie. I have my crucifix on. I go through the hotel lobby. I get to the elevator. Now, as I walk into the elevator, the only other person is a little white lady in there. So I didn't say anything to her. I just, I just looked at her and smiled. I just, and nodded my head like, like, the, you know, the, like, hello. And her eyes got real big, and she backed up to the back of the elevator and grabbed her purse. Now, I was a cop for 23 years. So when she backed up, I actually wasn't really worried about that because I have investigated more rapes than I can count. And I understand that women, she might have been traumatized, PTSD, because of something that may have happened to her. And, and, and now, you're elevator, you're in a confined space with a stranger. So I get it. That's maybe a nervous reaction to back up. That's why. But what got me is, why did she grab her purse? 
What did she think I was good? I mean, I'm dressed in a suit with a crucifix. But all she saw was big black guy. And that hurts. What she didn't see was immigrant to the United States. What she didn't see was the first person in the history of his family ever to go to college. She didn't see person who travels 250,000 miles a year, who deaconed for the Pope. She didn't see that. All she saw was big, scary, scary black guy. And when people look at you like that, it hurts. Because she didn't see me. She saw a caricature of me. And that hurts. Now, I think this whole racist, prejudice thing is learned behavior. Learned behavior, that means we can unlearn it. And here's how. Let me give you an example. As Pat said, I went to Notre Dame. My, so I lived in a triple in Holy Cross Hall. May she rest in peace. Is no longer there anymore. But I lived in a huge room, triple. So I was the first one to get to the room. Now, just to show you how old I am, back then, when I was a freshman at ND, there was no internet, there was no social media. You got a letter saying, here are your roommates, their name and city and state. You couldn't Google them, you couldn't look them up, you couldn't do social media because there's nothing like that back then. So I got to the room first, and I'm, I said, you know, I don't want to unpack and lay my stuff around because, you know, I want to wait till the other two guys get here, let's figure out how we're going to do this. So I was sat on the edge of the bed, I got bored, I pulled out my guitar, and I started playing some Van Halen. Now, as I'm playing Van Halen, I think I was playing Panama. One of the roommates walks in. His name is Ed. He goes, which one are you? Because remember, this, all you had was a list with two names. I said, I'm Harold. He said, you're black. I'm like, uh-oh. I'm saying to myself, this ain't good. And then he goes, what are you playing? I said, Van Halen. Black people listen to Van Halen? Oh, Lord have mercy, this is bad. This is bad. So what I come to learn is this. Ed was from a very affluent suburb of New York City. He went to a high school with only one black person in it. He had no experience at all with people that looked like me. All he saw was what he saw in movies and television, what his friend said. Now he has to live with me. But what happened during that year? We got to know each other. And during that year, he was able to see past the color, and me too, see past the color, and to see each other. Here's how, what, what sealed the deal. Now, back then, it was called the Black Cultural Arts Club, BCAC. And we used to have parties, because a lot of us didn't want to go to the bars and get drunk with fake IDs, like, like the typical college stuff. We just wanted to have a good time. So the university rented us some space, and we just had a DJ, and we just had a dance party. No alcohol, no drugs, just dancing and having fun. Now, a, a, a lot of the black students, including football players, would go. So I invited Ed to come with me one night. I said, Ed, instead of going out to the bars and getting drunk, come with me. He goes, I can't go to something like that. I'm, only, I'm the only white guy there. I said, it doesn't matter, man. Just come and have some fun. Forget about drinking. Just, well, I don't know. I said, well, there's going to be football players there. He goes, oh, okay, because he wants to meet the guys on the team. So he comes with me. And so we walk in, and the music is pumping. Now, back then it was New Jack Swing, right? Teddy Riley and Guy and that kind of stuff. And so we walk in, and boom, boom. Man, the, the music's pumping. And I'm like, yeah, come on, Ed. So I go out onto the floor, and I'm dancing. And Ed is kind of standing up like by himself like this. And now, I don't know why I remember her name. Lois Jackson came out, grabbed Ed, pulled him out onto the floor. Come on, Ed! And Ed, at first, was doing his, like, white robot thing, you know, like. <laughs> but then, he, then, then she was like, come on, Ed! Come on! And I was like, whoa, what's going on here? I mean, it, well, it was crazy. But he had so much fun. 2.30 in the morning, we're walking back to our dorm, Holy Cross. He's just talking, oh, I had so much fun. That was so great. And that opened up a whole new, because now he's thinking differently. Because now he's entering into our experience. So Ed and I end up rooming together again sophomore year. And then after graduation, we were in each other's weddings. 
I was in Ed's wedding. He was in my wedding. Right? How does that happen? How do you got from your black to being each other's weddings? That's what happens when you see the image and likeness of God in the person standing in front of you. Now, here's the problem when it comes to issues of pro-life. When, you, when my wife and I got pregnant, what do we, the, the world said, well, it's not really a, a, a person, it's a blob of tissue. It becomes, so wait, two human beings come together to create what, a pizza, a brick? And then at some magical point, it becomes a human being? That's ridiculous. Do you know why they have to say that? Because in order to impose your will on someone, you have to dehumanize them. So think about it. When someone's in a coma, what do you, what do you call that person? You're a vegetable. Does that sound human to you? Think about it. Simple example, two kids on a playground get ready to fight. Do they say, I think of you as a brother in Christ, and then punch him in the face? No. You are a piece of this. You're a mother of this. You're a, we, we call each other these names. Why? Because you are slowly dehumanizing the person in your mind. And when you sufficiently dehumanize them, now you can impose your will on them. That's how, that's how I work with slavery. The Dred Scott decision, 1857, said that black people were property and not human beings. Here's part of the decision. It said this. Slaves had for more than a century been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race and so far inferior that they had no rights that the white man was bound to respect and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. And then he says, it's too clear to dispute that the enslaved African race was not intended to be included. And the unhappy black race were separated by whites, uh, by indelible marks, that means permanent marks that can't be removed, and were never thought of or spoken of except as property. They had to say that, because if you look at a person of color and say, you're a human being, you can't enslave them. Same thing with babies. They have to say they're not human because that's how you can kill them if they're not human. It's ridiculous. But let's speak truth here. Now, in mass, many of you Catholics know that most of the homilies are done by the priest, and rightly so. The priest is the shepherd, and the sheep need to hear from the shepherd. The deacons, we're the sheepdogs, okay? <laughs> you, you hear from us every once in a while. So in my parish, I give homilies at Mass once a month. Now, when I prepare my homilies, I always prepare them before our Lord in adoration, Eucharistic adoration. Why? I want to make sure that what comes out of my mouth is not what Deacon Harold wants to say, it's what God wants to say through Deacon Harold. Because remember how this works. We're just the instruments. God's the musician. And so we have to be finely tuned instruments in God's hands. So I prepared. Now, this was summertime. So it wasn't like a pro-life month like November or January. But I felt that the readings lent themselves to a pro-life message that weekend. So I wrote a nice pro-life homily. And again, my church, only 109 families. Really small parish. There's maybe 20 people at the 5 p.m. mass on Saturday. So... Mass begins like normal. Father does the opening prayer. The lector gets up to do the first reading. And I notice this young lady coming to the back of the church, and she kind of pauses. Then she sits down. And I said, oh, I don't know her. So I made a mental note, say something to her after Mass. And so Mass went like normal. I read the gospel, preached the homily. Mass went normal. We processed out. I went up to her. I said, excuse me. I said, I'm Deacon Harold. I... I serve here at Immaculate Heart. Are you visiting with us today? Yes. Oh, and you're pregnant. Congratulations. How far along are you? I don't know. And right then I said, do you want to talk? She said, yes. So we slid down to the end of the pew, 
And she tells me she's from Portland. And she was raised with her single mom. Dad, just like me, my parents are divorced, single mom. I helped my mom raise my brothers and my sister. And she was raised by her single mom with only her little brother. When she was a senior in high school, she said, I'm an adult now. I'm going to make adult decisions. And her first adult decision, hitchhike to Los Angeles. So she hitchhiked from, uh, with her best friend from I-5 in Portland all the way down to Los Angeles. When she got here, her and her best friend got jobs as waitresses, and they got a cheap apartment. And they started living the California dream, parties, beaches, the club scene. And then after a couple years, drugs, alcohol, sex, she's pregnant. She goes to the guy who she thinks is the father and says, I'm pregnant. She said that he reached into his pocket, pulled out his wallet, took out a credit card and gave it to her and said, go to Planned Parenthood and take care of your problem. Now, she didn't want to hurt the child, but she didn't know what else to do. So she takes the card. So she thought, you know what? I'll wait a week or so. I'll tell him that I did it, and then we can go from there. That was her plan. So a week or so later, she calls him up. He comes back. He takes back the credit card. Did you take care of it? Yeah, I did. Good. And he leaves. And she never sees him again. Now, as the months tick by, she starts to feel the baby moving. And she has a prodigal son moment. What am I doing? It's bad enough I'm wasting my own life. Am I going to waste the life of this child? So just like the prodigal son, she decides to go home. She goes to the Salvation Army. They buy her a one-way bus ticket back to Portland. She gets home. Mom answers the door. Shop, surprised to see her daughter. The daughter explains, Mom, here's what's going on. Explains the situation. Her mom says, oh, you want to make adult decisions? Well, I hope your kid turns out to be like you and slams the door in her face. Now she's pregnant and homeless. She doesn't know where else to go. So where does she decide to go? Planned Parenthood, because they help people. She goes to the Planned Parenthood, which is one of the largest, the one in Portland is one of the largest in the entire West Coast. It's an entire city block, two stories. And of course, it's in the black neighborhood on Martin Luther King Boulevard because Margaret Sanger was a eugenicist and a racist. She wrote in my book, I, I went to the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., and I read her writings. She wrote, she does not want the population to know she wants to exterminate the Negro population. Exterminate, we were rats or vermin. That's Margaret Sanger, that's Planned Parenthood. But she has nowhere else to go. She goes in, she fills out an intake form. She sits down with a counselor. The counselor's pushing, pushing, pushing abortion. She said, wait a minute. What about, like, adoption? What are my other options? And she said, the counselor said, you're young. You made a mistake. You could take care of that mistake right now and get on with the rest of your life. And she said, well, uh, okay, well wait a minute. There's got to be something else. She, she said she got... So frustrated, she, she just got up and walked out. Just like that, just got up and walked out as the person's still talking. So now she's standing on Martin Luther King Boulevard, busy street. She doesn't know what to do. But Catholics who are away from the church have a default setting, like a computer. If, if the computer messes up, it goes back to what it knows. So what if far away Catholics know you got to go to church? She takes out her phone and, go phone and Googles Catholic Church. First hit, Immaculate Heart. Hey, that's right down the street. She walks five blocks down MLK, makes her right on North Stanton. She goes to the corner of North Williams and North Stanton. There's Immaculate Heart. When she came in that Saturday night, she had just come from Planned Parenthood. Now, she did not know mass was going on. Her thought was find the closest Catholic church, go in and pray, and figure out what to do next. But when she saw mass had started, 
She said, oh, I don't want to disturb the service. So she just went in and sat down. She told me, I did not intend to stay for the whole mass, but your homily gave me hope. Okay, hold on a second. So I went and got Father Nicholas. I said, Father, you see that young lady over there? We got a problem. So I explained him what was going on. He goes, well, you're the deacon. Take care of it. So I went on my phone. I have a list of uh, physicians for life, pro-life physicians. I called the one, by the way, whose dad is a deacon. I called him because I know he has privileges at Emmanuel Hospital across the street from our parish. So I called him first. Hey, deacon, great to hear from you. Doc, we got a problem. I told him real quick. Meet me across the street in 15 minutes. So we met him in the emergency room. We went up to OBGYN. Now, at that time of night, there's no nurses. There's no other doctors. He's doing this himself. So he's in the exam room with her. I'm standing in the hallway because I've got a bunch of kids, and I've been to all those appointments, and you got you to take off your clothes, put that skimpy gown on. I don't know this girl, and the church guy's enough problems. I'm standing out in the hallway. So the doctor is taking blood, urine, He's doing a physical exam, blood pressure, all that stuff. Then he says to her, I'd like to do an ultrasound. She said, that's where you can see the baby, right? He said, yeah, w would that be okay? She said, well, okay. Then she yells, Deacon, can you come in with me? So he went to an adjacent room where the ultrasound machine was. And doctor got her set up. She's lying here. I'm standing here, the machine is here, the doctor's on the other side of the machine. So I'm just, just there just to be moral support, I guess, for her. So when the doctor puts the jelly on her stomach, she reaches up and grabs my hand. I'm like, oh, you're okay. I've been through this before. You're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. So I'm holding her hand. And the doctor starts. That's the sound the ultrasound machine makes, right? So for the first 10, 15 seconds, he's not saying anything. So I think he was looking for like maybe birth defects or something. But after 15, 20 seconds, he goes, would you like to see? She said, yes. So he flips the monitor around, and I lean in, and I, I know what I'm looking at. In fact, I have twins. You do twice as many ultrasounds when you're having multiples. So I'm looking like, oh, that's so cute. And she's not quite sure. She goes, watch this. Wow, there's a leg. And you can see that femur bone, clear as day in that leg. Then he went, wow, there's a hand. And then he slid over. Whack. That heart is pounding. And now she starts squeezing my hand. And she said, they told me it wasn't a person. They told me it was a blob of tissue. Who told you that? Planned Parenthood. So the doctor says, would you like to find out the sex of the child? Yes. So I said, oh, this ought to be interesting because sometimes the little people don't cooperate. But that night, the Lord was on our side. So the doc, wow, it's a boy. Now she's squeezing my, and she's shaking. And she kept looking at the screen. And tears were coming down her face. She kept saying over and over again, my baby, my son, my baby. I, I could still smell the room. I could still feel her, her cold, clammy hand shaking in my hand. I remember looking at the doctor. The doctor got tears coming down his face. I'm like, oh, man, this is heavy right here. Ooh, I so after the doctor finishes, he prints out pictures of the baby, and he gives her a card. You call me next week and make an appointment. I will take care of you for the rest of your pregnancy for free. But we still got a problem. She got nowhere to live. So I called the Crisis Pregnancy Center, which is run by our Protestant brothers and sisters. Now, how do they know me? I help raise money for their ultrasound machines. So I said, hey, guys, it's Deacon Harold. Hey, Deacon. I said, well, we got a problem. Bring her here. So I brought, now, they didn't have a place for her to stay, but they loved on this girl. They didn't judge her. They didn't condemn her. They treated her like they were their own daughter. It was beautiful. Now, 
They did something very creative. They didn't have a place for her to stay, but this was a large evangelical church. They have people in the church that were already approved through the state foster system. All the background checks, everything was done. So when they have a rare situation like this where a pregnant woman needs temporary housing until they found a permanent place for her to stay, they would call one of these foster people. And so they called, they found the family that was willing to take her for a week or so. And I went with them to the house because I was still a cop back then. So I'm like, check her for guns and drugs and stuff, right? So she goes in and she's sitting down with the couple and she's having a conversation with them. And after about 40 minutes or so, I'm thinking, everything looks good here. I think I'm going to take off. So I said to her, is there anything else we can do for you? She said, oh, no, you've already done too much. I said, no, no, no. This is the church. This is what we do. How about this? How about you give me your number? And I'll call you next week and, and, and follow. Oh, that'd be great, Deacon. Thank you so much. Gives me a number, I leave. I call back a few days later. Oh, Deacon, these people are so wonderful. You know, they've been praying with me. And I, I've been praying. I think God wants me to come back to the Catholic Church. I said, she goes, but... Aren't there classes you're supposed to take? But it's the summer. Don't those classes start in the fall? I said, oh, no, the classes start right now. Let's go. Bible, catechism, that's all we need. Now, she was already Catholic, so basically I gave her a refresher course the rest of the summer. Father, she did a profession of faith, heard a confession. Father received her back into the church. She has the baby in the fall. Now, she wants me to do the baptism. Remember, I'm just the sheepdog. I got to ask the shepherd. So Father Nicholas says, of course you're going to do it. You've been in this thing since the beginning. And who showed up at the baptism? Grandma. Her mom. Because this child helped brought, bring the family back together. This young lady today, she's, she's no longer in our parish because now she's reunited with her family. She's back at their parish, which is a huge parish with a big school and all that stuff. And I remember going to pick up my twins, because that's where my twins went to school. And I would, every time I see little David running around in the parking lot, I said to myself, what if I would have stood in that ambo and preached a Barney homily? You know the homily sometimes you hear from priests? I love you, you love me. Come on, give me a break. What if I didn't have the courage to preach the truth? The truth in love, Ephesians 4.15 it always has to be the truth, and it always has to be in love. Now, one other quick example here. You cannot respect anybody else to see the image and likeness of God in that person and, unless you respect yourself first. Let me give you an example. I was a cop for, I was a police chief of my 23 years. 11 of them was as a police chief on a college campus. So I know what goes on on college campuses. This lady, this young lady, 20-year-old junior, comes into my office and says, this guy is sending me naked pictures of himself on Snapchat. Now, I wasn't too familiar with Snapchat back then, but I said, okay, show me the pictures. And she said, the pictures disappeared. They disappeared? I guess you know how Snapchat, they, they go away after, okay, all right, fine. So I bring in the guy, and I said, do you know such and such? Yes, I know her. You know, um, she's saying that you sent naked pictures of yourself to her. Is that true? That young man bowed his head, and he shook it like this. He said, no, let me tell you what's going on. I'm a virgin, and I plan to stay this way until my wedding night with my wife. There's a group of girls in my class who think that's funny. And they're having a contest between themselves to see who can get me to break my vows before I get married. I'm not sending pictures to them. They're sending pictures to me. Really? <laughs> Where are the pictures at? They disappeared. <laughs> what, what am I supposed to do now? I got, he said this, she said this, I got no pictures. So here's what I did. I went back to the young lady. What do you want to have happen here? Do you want to press criminal charges? Or do you want to go through the university's internal discipline system? 
She said, I want to press charges, which is exactly what I wanted to hear because when I filed those charges with the DA's office, what did that give me access to? What did that allow me to do? Get a subpoena. A subpoena for what? Oh, no, I don't care about the phone. I, Snapchat's servers. Why? All that stuff you delete off your phone, they keep it all. Oh, I deleted it. I erased my phone. They still got your pictures. They still got everything. So I issued a subpoena to Snapchat, and I got the information that I wanted. And here's what I did. Here's what I did. I brought the young lady back in, and I had a folder sitting in front of me. She's sitting across from me. I had a folder sitting in front of me. She goes, I'm, I said, I'm just about finished my investigation, and I want you to know that when I brought the young man, and he said that you were actually sending pictures to him, not the other way. He's a liar! He's just trying to not get in trouble. I said, you know what? I thought the same thing until I saw this. I opened up that folder and slid a picture of her naked behind right in front of her. <laughs> Where'd you get that? The same place I got this one. And this one. And this one. I started sliding pictures in front of her. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You got to, here, here's the deal. Now, because I went to Snapchat servers, it had the date, the time, and the IP address from her phone to his phone. There was not one photo from his phone to her phone. All the photos. Now, there were also some other photos in there who, that were not from her phone. I said, who are these other girls? Well, I'm not going to tell them my friends. I said, well... Here's your choice. You're going to tell me who these girls are or you're going to find another place to go to school. And we threw her out of school. You have to understand something. All these pictures and all this stuff that you think is cool, you think it's fun, they keep it forever. It never goes away. And I'll tell you something else. Employers now are looking at social media accounts. When I was hiring police officers to work for me, they had to put down all their social media handles and stuff so we could, oh, well, that's, that's my private thing. No, it's not. Now, if you want to work here, they're asking to see that stuff. Why? You're not just representing yourself. You're representing them. So unless you have respect for yourself, you will not have respect for others. So let me wrap it up here. People will say to me, you're a black Catholic. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm a Catholic who's black. Oh, what do you mean? Are you denying your black identity? Nope. Because when I die and stand before Jesus Christ, he's not going to ask me how black I am. He's going to say, did you pick up your cross and follow me? Because guess what? Remember what I said? If Jesus says, remember what I said in the Gospels? In order to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. And guess what? When I picked up that cross, people spat on me, and they mocked me, and they made fun of me, and they tortured me. Were you willing to do that for me like I was willing to do that for you? What am I going to say? Well, I was afraid to preach the truth because people might defriend me. Or they might cancel me or deplatform me. Oh, check this out. Back in July, I got an email from YouTube, after a review of your current uploads, we have decided that your content does not create a safe environment for our community. Therefore, we are demonetizing you. So I said, well, what does that mean exactly? So then they didn't take down any of my posts. They didn't maybe change anything. They just said, I can't make money off of the videos anymore. So I, I said, oh, is that all? I wrote them back. Thank you so much for letting me know. Keep your 30 pieces of silver. I don't care about making my, I'm here for Jesus Christ. So our identity is a divine identity. My identity is not defined by my color, by my race, by my gender, who I have sex with. That doesn't define who I am. I am 
am an adopted son of the living God. I am a brother of Jesus Christ who worships the, my God, covered with the blood of the Lamb, who receives him body, blood, soul, divinity, the Eucharist. It is a divine identity. And when you look at someone standing in front of you, you uh, uh, here's prayer. Oh, I'm colorblind. I don't see color. Yes, you do, fool. Of course you see color. But what you have to see is not just color. You have to see the image and likeness of God and the person standing in front of you. Because once you see that divine identity, now you're able to appreciate all the other beautiful gifts that that person brings to the table. I was born in Barbados. I love my Caribbean heritage. I love our food. I love our culture. I love our music. I still speak our dialect. I love everything about being black. I thank God every day I'm black. But that is not my identity. My identity is a divine identity. And now I'm able to see you and you and you the way God sees you because I'm seeing your divine identity first. And now that I appreciate that, I can now accept and open my heart to everything else that you bring to the table. That's how we defeat racism. That's how we build a world of justice and integrity. That's how we see the humanity in every single human being made in God's image and likeness. I want to say just one final thing here, then I'll wrap it up. Just I have this opportunity. Like I said, my parents are divorced. We grew up poor, single mom. My mom was a cardiac care nurse at Beth Israel Hospital in Newark. My mom worked the graveyard shift so that she can spend the most time with us. You know how many times I saw my mother going to work with holes in her shoes and running her stockings because we needed stuff. I learned the meaning of sacrifice from my mother. Why did she do that? Because she, it was so important to her that we have a Catholic education. I had Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, Catholic college and Catholic graduate school. So important to my mom we have a Catholic education. Now, here's what changed everything for me. Because I'm a kid from the hood, right? Statistically, I should be dead or in jail. But here's what happened. When my dad left, I helped my mom with our family. My mom knew that I needed positive male role models in my life. Not to take the place of my dad, but to show me what authentic masculinity was like. Here's what changed everything for me. <clears throat> my first grade in high school was history. Mr. Frank Mullen was the teacher. When Mr. Mullen handed back his exams, he would turn your, pa your paper over and walk up and down the aisles of the desk and turn your paper over. So I, I studied. I'm nervous. Whew, whew. He turns the paper over on my, and he keeps going. So I look, whew, whew. B plus. And I audibly said, yes! Never forget this as long as I live. Mr. Mullen stopped walking. He backed up. He looked my little 14-year-old self in the face. He said, and you're happy with that? And I'm, thought, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, that's a B plus. That's pretty good. You know, that's not bad. So I go home, and I'm so proud to show my mom, mommy, look, I got my first test in high school. Look, I got a B plus. Then I told her what Mr. Mullen said. She said, no, son, you don't understand. What he meant was you can do better than that. And until that time, except for my mom, nobody pushed me. Nobody challenged me to be more than my environment. And what I learned was this. My past helped shape me into the person I am today. But my past does not determine my future. A deep, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ determines my life. And when I started doing that, I said, well, what if I studied a little bit harder? And then that transferred to sports. I was undefeated my senior year in wrestling. What if I worked a little harder? When everybody else leaves the room, what if I spent another 20 minutes on the mat? What if I, and that Mr. Mullen flipped the switch in me and it changed everything in my life. You guys have an amazing opportunity here at J. At J. Sarah. You have amazing teachers and administrators here. And you know, the only reason why they work here is for the money. You know that, right? They're, they're only in it for the money. 
They're all laughing, right? Because, no, they're not here for the money. They're here because they love you. I'm here not because I'm being paid to be here. I'm here because I love you. And I want you to see what's possible. You know what? The teachers in seventh grade told my mother, and my mother never told me this until I had my Notre Dame degree. She came to my graduation. She was crying. I said, Mommy, what's wrong? I said, goes, well, first of all, you're the first person in our family ever to go to college. I'm so proud. Then she told me what the, what the teacher said. She said, your son will never amount to anything. They told my mom that in seventh grade. Why? They didn't know what was going on in our house growing up. All they saw was I was coming to school acting out. They had no idea what was going on in our house, the abuse and the drinking and the other stuff. Your teachers, like mine, will help you to believe. They believe in you even when you don't believe in yourself. That changed everything for me. And so take advantage of this opportunity from your coaches. Mr. Mike DiPiano, my wrestling coach, was like a father to me. I love that man to this very day. My scoutmaster, back when Boy Scouts were really Boy Scouts, not the sellouts and the wokeness that they are now. But back then, Dr. Alan H. Tobe was like a father to me. That man was a white Jewish doctor who would come into the hood every Monday night to be with his sons. That's what he would tell us. You're my sons. So do not squander this opportunity to learn, not just academically, but to learn from your teachers, from your administrators, what it's like to be a true man and woman of God. So to wrap things up, you know, we all know the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jewish guy gets mugged on the road. The priest and the Levite who are Jewish leave him there. But the Samaritan, who they're supposed to hate, he's the one that helps him. Now, what would you have done in that situation? Everybody looks back and thinks, oh, of course, I would have helped. Really. But what if that person who was lying on the side of the road was the person who raped you? What if that person lying on the side of the road was drunk and killed your parents in a car accident? What if that person lying on the side of the road got you hooked on pornography or drugs and alcohol? As we walk by that person on the side of the road, our hearts are burning with the fire of hatred. You deserve it! That's what our instinct would be. We would leave him lying there, not even give it a second thought. Yet our Lord gives us a new model. The Samaritan exemplifies a new standard of holiness where God no longer requires us to be separated from each other, but calls us to be vehicles of his love and mercy in the lives of others. He calls us not to exclude anyone on the grounds of prejudice or racism. Our Lord gives us no other options and makes no exceptions. If we are to truly have human dignity and defeat racial injustice, we must always lead with love. We must be the Samaritans. Amen. Thank you all very much. I think uh, one of the, two of the questions that we wrestle with when you're in high school is what does it mean to be a human and what does it mean to be, in our case in, the, in a, at a Catholic high school, what does it mean to be a son or daughter of God? And Deacon Harold gave us really great, great fodder to talk, to think about those issues. And so I, on behalf of the school, as the principal of the school, just thank you for this edifying talk today. Let's give another round of applause to Deacon Harold for a fantastic speech. Thank you.